Good evening and welcome to this online featuring uh, the guests from one of the new Australian documentaries exploring the issues facing the Barker, the Darling River. When the river runs dry, explores the rules governing the Murray-Darling Basin and how they are destroying the environment and displacing communities, with water rights and security becoming increasingly becoming vital issues for communities when the river runs dry offers a hope for a better future. My name's Megan Williams and I'm from Friends of the Earth and I've spent a lot of my time uh, learning about the policies and the problems that have led to these complex issues in the Murray-Darling and I'm really excited to be bringing you this panel tonight. Before I introduce the panel, I would like to acknowledge that wherever you're joining us from, if you're in Australia or uh, we are meeting on stolen land, I am coming to you from the Kulin Nations and I'd like to pay my respects to the Boon Wurrung Elders. I'd also pay, like to pay respects to all Elders past and present from across this great continent and acknowledge that traditional owners, as we've seen from the film, are on the front line of this issue, feeling the impacts firsthand and also leading the fight to create the solutions. So on the panel today, we have, um, we have the filmmaker Rory McLeod and cinematographer. We also have Peter Yates, the film researcher and writer, Bruce Shillingsworth, Murawari and Budichi Man, a talented artist, artist and Water for the Rivers activist. We have Kate McBride from Tolano Station, Bradley Mogridge, a proud Murray from the Gamilaroi Nation with over 20 years experience in Aboriginal engagement, water and environmental science and has a huge list of credits to his name. Uh, and finally, we have Ross Thompson, the director of, of the Centre for Applied Water Science at the University of Canberra and has over 110 peer-reviewed papers in the area of, of aquatic ecology. So uh, perhaps to start us off, um, I do just want to apologise to the people watching at home. We had a few technical difficulties getting started. Um, but yeah, to kick us off, Rory, could you tell us a little bit about the film, what inspired you to make it and um, yeah, what it was like to, to be out there doing all that filming? Well, when we saw the, the footage of those two ancient Murray pod, we literally hopped in the car and headed up the river to, to try and see what was going on. Um, it was really that compelling um, and it was really shocking when we started hearing the stories of, of what was going on in that river. Um, we just wanted to bring people's voices, people along the river's voices to the forefront. Um, a lot of the news was just looking at uh, the what happened to what caused the death of the fish or just the, the horror of the event itself. Um, and we wanted to go more in depth and more details to, to everyone. Yeah, the media had been um, really you know, focused on fish and we care about fish too, but um, there was another story that was being completely missed altogether and that was the the pain that was happening to the people who identify with this river, the people whose country this is. And um, we just, we went out there not knowing a lot. You know, we, we knew over the last few years, several years, that there was something wrong on the Darling. But um, when we went up there and started asking around and talking to people, it became obvious that, as they say, something was rotten in the state of Denmark. And um, rotten indeed, and it wasn't just the dead fish. So uh, it grew from there, and we we travelled thousands of kilometres talking to people, and well, you can see the result in the film. Um, what, it just became a bit of an obsession for a while there, and uh, well, yeah, we was we was busy. I'm sure you were. So, um, Kate, you're out at Tolano Station, about 40 kilometres from Menindee, uh, and it was your dad holding 
the the fish in that viral video that really exposed what was happening out on the Darling River. What was it like being there that day? And we've just got you on mute. Sorry. <laughs> The day before, we saw a local put a video up and we were like, wow, like could not believe it. And it wasn't a great deal of fish, but it was still, you know, like how can this happen? And then Dad and I were like, let's go for a drive up, see what we can find. Just, you know, we this should not be happening. And, yeah, we um, jumped in the car and everything and um, we spent all day looking at all these dead fish and then it was just like the most draining, heartbreaking day i've ever experienced and we, we sort of called it we're like look we need to get out of this environment this is just like too hard to watch sort of thing and we came around one more bend and that's where we found these murray cod and it was just a spur of the moment thing the guys like robert and um, our friend dick arnold they were just like let's get in let's do one more video and yeah like they did that video and all of a sudden you know we posted it on our social media and it just went crazy um but like it's like the worst day of my life because you just like that many like animals lives and just seeing them and knowing that it was humans that have done this i just you know i, I was distraught and um unfortunately like i'm never ever going to forget it mm. yes a day hard to forget for sure so just for the people that have joined us we were experiencing a few technical difficulties so we're streaming via phone um, and we're recording so you will be able to see the video uh, from zoom later on we will post it after we've done the recording um, and bruce so the fish kills really exposed what the issues were but of course there were issues along the, with the management of the rivers for a long long time before that you know what what's been the impact on communities along the river that, that you know well i think it's, it's nothing new to first nation people and first nation people have been noticing the changes over the last 20 30 years because it impacted our environment and, and first nation people feel the brunt because they lived on the rivers when right along our rivers and waterways First Nation people have lived for thousands and thousands of years. Now we've got the upset, the balance of our environment. The rivers are completely gone. And that affected our, our food sources along the rivers, our dreaming stories, our cultural practices, our traditions, the passing down of knowledge and stories, the holistic approach that relates to the water being in the river and being a part of our life. And that's why um, as First Nation people have felt you know, the big extent and the brunt of uh, what's happening with our rivers. Yes. And um, Brad, so you work in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in incorporating your ancestors' knowledge into policy recommendations. How do you bring those two things together? How do you bring the knowledge, the traditional knowledge, to the table in a way that will change the actions of the government? I suppose the first challenge is making sure we get a seat at that table. <clears throat> at the moment, we don't really have, we're not even in the room um, unless we keep banging on the door. <clears throat> like Brother Bruce, you know, we, we just got to keep banging on the door and eventually we'll get into that room. And, you know, the, the basin plan allows for it, state legislation sort of allows for it, but really, <laughs> regard um, doesn't mean anything until we get a fair say and a fair share of water then that's when things will change and I suppose what I'm trying to do is change the way we think about water how we value water it's not a commodity at the moment it's got a dollar value on it and I think if if Aboriginal people had a say in how they value water I think we'd realize soon that water is without it you die as simple as that and I think a lot of those Western communities have experienced that. They've lived through it. You know, they've survived. And a lot of our mobs have survived major climate changes in climate. Um, we're still here. And I suppose with the thing that's trying to kill us now is policy. Mm. Yes. And so, Ross, just to bring you in there, 
you know, you're a scientist that's been publishing papers on this sort of stuff for a long time. Like, how settled is the science on, like, what is the root cause of this issue and how settled is the science and what's holding the solutions back? I think the science is quite settled. It's just that it's more complex than people would wish. Um, we want to point fingers at single sources or uh, single problems, but the reality is we've got climate change, which is drying these systems down anyway. Um, then you've got uh, management, uh, which is taking water out of these systems. And, and then we have a piece of policy that, in my opinion, isn't particularly deeply flawed other than in the fact that it relies on states to implement it effectively. And from the earliest days of, of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and the Water Act, um, a lot of us were saying, this can only work if the states implement. And I think the reality is that we've seen a critical flaw, the Achilles heel of this policy, which is that it relied on state governments to be effectively implementing the policy on the ground. And so that policy on the ground is the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, uh, which the film sort of explores some of the issues held uh, in the way that it's implemented. What kind of, uh, like, what, where would the best place be to start in fixing some of those issues? Kate. What, um, what our family has been trying to push for for a number of years is a federal royal commission just to get to the bottom of everything that's been done. I mean, a massive amount of money has been spent. I think it's about seven or eight billion dollars of a 13 billion dollar plan. So it's a massive amount of taxpayers money that's already been spent. And unfortunately, a lot of these areas are worse off than ever before. So we're pushing for a federal royal commission to get to the bottom of what we've done well done wrong and sort of those you know um we've we've had hints that there's a lot of corruption going on when it comes to water and things like that and we need to get to the bottom of this because right now there's not a lot of trust in the basin plan um you know we, we're still all for the basin plan we need something to make sure the water is shared out equally um and that the environment gets its fair share but that's not happening right now. So um, we think that the it's not an easy way. I mean, it's, it's a big deal, a Federal Royal Commission, but we think that's the only thing that can completely restore the trust um, in the actual plan. And um, Rory and Peter, you travelled up and down the river there to listening to people. Was there a consistent... Uh, were there consistent views around that or were, is there, like, what are, what are the, some of the other solutions that you heard? Uh, other solutions were, I think one of the things that was most stark was the, the lack of understanding in, amongst ordinary people about what was going on. Stuff was happening and people didn't really... I mean, there was, obviously there were people who did know, but your average person in Burke or Brewarrina did not know what was behind all this. They were doing stuff. The government was doing stuff. And, um, you know, the solutions were give the water back, obviously. Um, but, yeah, I, I think it was really striking how... It, 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 it shone a light on this gap between what the government does and why they do it. And um, you know, that suits the government very nicely, thank you very much. But, um, yeah, I was really surprised that uh, there wasn't a... There wasn't a really good grip on what was going on and you know we didn't have it because we came up from central victoria but the people on the river themselves didn't seem to be um they knew something was wrong they knew they were being done over but why and how was another story and brad what do some of those policy solutions look like i suppose the when you look at it a lot of the plans and a lot of the legislation and policy are written without our input. 
and I suppose we don't really have a have a say up front. So a lot of this, you know, the 1901 Water Water Act in New South Wales was written pretty much without us. We weren't even classed as citizens. Um, and I suppose it's the, the challenge of when you look at the Basin Plan, you know, as written about the, with the best, you know, best available science and um, credible evidence. And a lot of uh, our mobs didn't have that, you know, and I, they have a lot of knowledge, but they don't have the big reports to bang on the table and submit. You know, I suppose that the way we have input into these processes, that needs to change as well. And, you know, it needs to be culturally appropriate, but also needs to, to allow our people to have a say in a lot of these issues, you know, not give away their cultural knowledge, but give their, their issues around the way water is managed. And, you know, at the moment, if we want water, we're going to go to the market and buy it. Mm. That's the biggest issue. Yeah. Mm. And one of the questions coming through on the live stream is where are these long promised cultural flows? Can you tell us what's happening with that? <laughs> yeah, look, um, I suppose. Oops, look, we've just got a lag on the screen there. Yeah, they're all cultural flows. Sorry, Brad, we might just get you to say that again because you just... Um, I off my video. Yeah, just skipped out. 300 years ago, everything was a cultural flow. Everything was... Am I still glitching? Can you hear no, me? you're good. Yep. Okay, good. Um, and I suppose when you start putting in barriers, diversions, storages, the whole environment changes and cultural flows, they might take another... 20 years to come. You've got to look at how, how long it took environmental flows to get a leg up. You know, they've been around for 20 odd years and cultural flows is old business for us, but it's new business for policy. And potentially it could be a threat to the way people perceive water. And I think it's going to be a hard slog for us to embed um, cultural water and values of water based around cultural values into, into the way we manage water. And I think that's gonna take some time. Um, they're out there, there's a lot of mobs doing it, um, but I suppose it's, it's not everyone's cup of tea either. You know, cultural flows isn't something to everyone, but they, that is a, a methodology and a way Aboriginal people can have a say. And, and I think it's, it's one way, but there are other ways. And I think that that's the challenge. The more we do, the more we get involved, the more opportunities, and I think, that's the way, we're, that's when we'll see the difference in the way we manage water. And Ross, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think the point that Brad makes is a really important one from lots of perspectives. With environmental flows, we've essentially given fish a bigger voice in water management than we have Indigenous Australians. And that's morally and ethically repugnant, um, never mind anything else. But let's think about it purely from a an economic perspective or from the perspective of a water user. What we want from water management policy is certainty. We want to be able to know how we can operate our businesses. And the next generation of water reform needs to make sure that we have all the voices at the table so that what we get out of it is a stable, secure and equitable water management system. Um, if we fail to do that, it actually hurts everyone. It doesn't give rights to Indigenous Australians, nor does it give certainty to irrigated agriculture. So the next generation of water reform, and it's coming to us in 2023 and 2026, needs to have all of the people at the table. Um, and if we fail to do that, then we've failed a generation of Australians. Absolutely. And another comment we have on the live stream is about the promise for a traditional owner on the uh, board of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. Uh, Uncle Bruce, do you have any views on uh, having a traditional owner on the Murray-Darling Basin Authority or what genuine representation would look like? Well, when we talk about representative on, our, on any committee, we're going to make sure that that representative represent all the nations along the, the waterways, along our Murray-Darling. What we're seeing now is we, you know, it, it's good that we've got one person now that sits on the board, but we want to make sure that that representative 
It sits on out the board, the Murray Darling Basin represents all the nations. And have got dialogue and are working with those communities along the rivers. So I believe that we, we should have an equal representative. I believe that there should be an, an, another a board that sits alongside the Murray Darling. That board should be representative of all the nations along the waterway that sit each equally with the Murray Darling Basin board now that sits at the moment. Absolutely. And Can I just add to that? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, look, I totally agree with Bruce. It's, but it's going to be a massive challenge for whoever that, whoever that person is. You know, they have to represent 40-odd nations. Um, they also have to, if it's a male, they, how are they going to deal with women's business? If it's a female, how are they going to deal with men's business? You know, there's, it's a massive challenge for this one person and there's going to be a lot of pressure on that person. So I, I don't envy that person, but I suppose it's a, it's a stepping stone in the right direction. And, you know, I suppose the, the Basin Community Committee has an, an Aboriginal chairperson, so I suppose that that's a massive step as well under the, under the authority. So, but it's going to be a tough gig for that person. Huge. And, Peter, you had your hand up. Would you like to...? Yeah, um, I think... I want to broaden it out to the extent that that river, all rivers have rights to be rivers. And, um, you know, we can talk about, you know, indigenous people and irrigators, and we can talk about, um, you know, management, but we've got a terrible gap in our, um, in our legal system, in our, political system that simply ignores the fact that a river has a right to be a river, just like a cod has a right to be a cod, and it has a right to have water to swim in. And you know, this is one of the big things that we need, to, um, we need to break through on urgently. And it's absolutely true also that you'll find a very high level of congruence between Indigenous interests and river interests or you know the nature not not a total congruence but there's a very strong congruence there and um you know this river is not a resource to be divvied up by humans this river exists in and of itself and that is a crucial thing and until we as humans all of us get our head around that we are going to keep destroying the planet And another question we had coming through on the live stream is, uh, what is the COVID-19 crisis going to do to, um, you know, to the campaigns and the work that people are doing around these issues? You know, Parliament won't be sitting until August. Um, a lot of the local papers are closing down, local papers like the Barrier Daily Truth, which um, has done an excellent job at getting the news out. Uh, Bruce or Kate, do you want to talk about how um, how you think the communities along the in the far west uh, are going to be affected by this? Well, not only getting the media on board and getting that information out, but it's about our survival. I mean, we're gathering along the rivers, those social activities that we can't do anymore. Like I said, the passing down of knowledge and the stories have now stopped because those gatherings have stopped. We can't get to our sacred sites along the river. We can't get to those special places anymore. So we've been restricted on our movements. Um, the, the, the Western papers are now ceased. I mean, the only other way we can get our information out is by Facebook and social media. Um, we can't do any more, you know, protests and rallies, so that all stops. So, look, things have slowed down, but I believe we can still get the message out there and we can still pass all that information on and build that awareness about what's happening around our rivers. Absolutely. Uh, Ross, did you want to add? And I think, go ahead. Is, yeah. um, we're quite concerned that throughout this time where people can't come out and meet with us and things like that, that plans are actually going to get pushed through without the appropriate community consultation, like the Menindee Lakes 
project and things like that. We're really concerned about that. And the other reality of this, is these townships are struggling. I mean, we've been coming out of drought. We've had no river for a number of years now as well. And now we finally get our river back. And unfortunately, all our tourism dies. And we've, we've, got, we've put a stop to it. Us at Talano Station, townships like Menindee and Wilcania, they've actually asked people not to come out there because the reality is in the whole of sort of far west New South Wales, Broken Hill only has five ICU beds. So if this gets out into this region, it's going to be really scary for all of us. And we've completely quarantined here at Tolano Station, um, as have many other towns as well, because this, this will be really, really bad if it does get out here. And it's something that um, we're all very aware of and very scared of. And there's a comment on the, on the live feed about potentially putting the Menindee Lakes system SDL project on hold. Is that something that you'd like to see in this time? Okay. Yes, we we need that to happen. The, essentially, this um, like SDL adjustment sort of thing is essentially decommissioning these Menindee Lakes. Now, these are integral for the Darling River system, um, as well as all the birds and the fish and the Barkindji people and everyone around here. They're critically important. So right now, we are calling for that to occur because if these go through without the appropriate consultation and discussion around them, then it's going to kill this region. We saw it already happen. When the Wentworth to Broken Hill pipeline went in, it was really detrimental to this area and people didn't want well, we've just got to glitch. through. So if this plan does get, if this project, oh, sorry, we, we saw it with the, um, the Wentworth to Broken Hill pipeline. If this does happen and it gets pushed through, it will be hugely detrimental to this area. The Menindee Lakes are critically important for everything. They keep us alive. Um, and yeah, we're, we're calling for it to be stopped right now. And Ross, what, what's your opinion on this? Look, I think it is time to draw breath on that project, I think. Though the Menindee Lake system itself is obviously, it's essentially a, a created system. So it was constructed in the 50s. There was intensive um, development of that area to take it from what were ephemeral wetlands to, to larger lakes. They have now become an ecologically important part of the system. And we have to just get over the idea that anything that we built can be unbuilt. Um, we are managing this system really intensively. Um, and so we have to think not about restoring the system back to the way it was, how to manage it the best way we can in an intensive way. And I think what the fish kills identified was that we don't know enough about the functioning of the Mindy Lakes in that system. I was fascinated to ask fish biologists to say, you know, how important is the Mindy Lakes in terms of supporting fish populations upstream? And they went, oh, it's probably quite important. Now we need to do better than probably. So the reality is I think it is time to draw breath and make sure that we have the science in place to make good decisions. And the Menindee Lakes, of course, isn't the only SDL project planned to be built uh, across the Murray-Darling Basin. Uh, I'm based down in Victoria and I know some communities that are very concerned about projects on their country. Are, are these issues representative of the whole basin plan or is this is, is it more critically focused around Menindee? Russ? Look I think the reality is that the Darling system is a really challenging one. The Darling system is about letting water go by rather than pumping it out and using it for agriculture. It's about letting water flow off country as opposed to putting a dam in to trap it. It's a rather different system than the rest of the Murray where we have big storages like Lake Hume and it's about letting water out to support the system. It's much easier, if think of anything is easy, um, much easier to manage those systems by opening or closing the, um, the, the gates of a dam than it is by letting people pump or not pump and trying to manage and, and regulate that. So the Darling is where the Murray-Darling Basin plan particularly struggles, and it was evident from the outset that it was always going to be the most problematic part. The models in terms of looking at water flow versus rainfall, they don't work as well as you would wish in the Darling. It's very, very dry, very, very peaky kind of system. So across the rest of the basin, I have um, a lot of confidence that, that we're doing a pretty good job of starting to pull back some of the ecological values that were lost because of over abstraction of the river. 
In the darling, unfortunately, my confidence is, is much less. And Brad or uh, Bruce, would either of you like to chime in on this topic? Brad there? Brad, can you answer that? Um, yeah, look, I, it's, a, it's a massive challenge and I suppose it's, and we also forget the, the little brother or sister of groundwater and there's a lot of, I suppose, challenges in understanding the, the interactions with groundwater. There's a lot of, a lot of knowledge, Aboriginal knowledge in groundwater because when you're on a dry continent, if the surface water stops, you've got to know where groundwater is and I think um, a lot of our challenges with uh, groundwater you know you, we saw the northern adjustments happen or the northern northern basin adjustments and they soon found new groundwater so they could actually increase the surface water so you know there was there was some there was some modeling brilliance happened there i don't know if that you call it brilliance but i suppose what happened was that you know we saw the issue of um the system being manipulated for better outcomes in the north, unfortunately. And I think um, groundwater is, is, is a forgotten source of water. It's, it's pretty much, it's hard to regulate for one, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's another issue that, that, that is poorly understood in the basin, I believe. And um, so there is obviously a lot of issues um with the management of the darling and in this time of COVID-19 where we can't meet uh, we can't organize actions um what what can people do from home and what can people do to support the work that all of you are doing okay oh sorry <laughs> my internet dropped out um, well, I guess keeping updated on what's going on. We've got our Facebook page and we're continually updating people um, and just speaking to family and friends. I think the biggest thing with this whole campaign that we've experienced is people power and we need as many people to understand what's going on. I mean, when we started this campaign, like a few years ago, I remember people saying, why are you bothering? The people in the cities just don't care. And that's not what was really happening. It's just they didn't know. And so now since more and more people know, I mean, we do events and people rock up and that's like absolutely incredible. And of course, right now we can't be doing that, but um, you know, this will pass. And when that does happen, the more you know, the more you contact your politicians, ask for a federal royal commission and say that you care about water management and that essentially the, the environment deserves a fair share. Um, we're seeing the effects right now. The Darling River started flowing here at Tolano Station on Tuesday and it is incredible seeing the environment just come back to life because of these flows coming down and, you know, get because you can actually see the life getting brought back into this region and it really is incredible. So keep up to date um, and when this does pass, keep involved because that's the biggest thing. Thank you, Kate. And we did just drop out when you mentioned your Facebook page. So I'll just repeat it for everyone who at home. That's the Tolano Station Facebook page where you can check out lots of videos with all of what's happening. Um, and uh, before we move to someone else, Kate, could you just describe to us what it was like to see the water flowing down the river for the very first time after three, after however long it was um, there were no flows for? Oh, it was like the best day of my life. We all, we got to experience seeing the water enter Tolano Station on our boundary on Monday evening and we got to see it with the sunset, which was incredible. And then Tuesday, it hadn't quite reached our homestead, so we got to spend the day watching the water come down past our homestead and enter our sort of pool in front of the house. And um, it, it was like I said before that the fish kill was one of the worst days of my life. And honestly, Monday and Tuesday were one of the best. But at the same time, it's still that heartbreaking feeling of this shouldn't be happening. We were still seeing, you know, a great deal of dead animals, um, dead fish, like their carcasses and things like that. And also the great big darling mussels as well. And they're not going to be brought back instantly. And I 
okay that these animals are still going to be there and that this will have brought life back into them but the scary thing is we don't know the effect of having such a dry river for so long is going to have on these animals so um you know we're, we're hopeful and we're so glad it's back but we need to remember why it was gone and the reality is in a year and a half's time the river could be gone again. We, the Menindee Lakes are not full. Um, if they were, we'd have about five or six years worth of water. They're not full. We've got a year and a half, so the fight continues. This isn't the end. This is just the start, and we need to keep pushing for better water management and less extraction occurring above us. Absolutely. And that water had been slowly making its way down the riverbed. And so, Bruce, could you tell us what it meant for the communities further upstream to who got to see that water for the first time, perhaps about a month ago. Look, it was exciting. Everyone got to see the river again. They got to fish and socialise on the rivers. But look, it, it's not the end. Like Kate said, the fight goes on. The struggle for First Nation people is you know, still happening. When we're out there still fighting, you get you know, proper drinking water for our communities right along the rivers. We want to get tanks, water tanks to put in for those communities. We're out there trying to get filters to put on the taps so our communities can have proper drinking water, you know, fresh filtered water to be able to drink. That's what we still need to keep fighting for and that's what we're doing now. We're still fundraising. <clears throat> but our people have suffered over the last 10, 15 years. Like I said, the long period of drought affected the health of First Nation people. The health of our people have deteriorated. I can go on and on and on and say, you know, talk about all the health problems that our people are faced with. Our environment, the animals, the wildlife are still not the same. That needs to come back. We still need to recover all that. Trees need to be planted along the rivers. Our medicinal use, medicine plants, we need to replant them again, regenerate them again, put them along the rivers. Those big river gums are dying. We need to start planting them again. We need things that keeps those, those communities alive. We need to bring those you know, animals, the birds, the wildlife, the environment back the way it was. So the fight's not finished, we've got to keep on going. Absolutely, we do have to keep on going. Uh, but we are probably running out of time. But before we finish, we might just get some final comments from everybody else on the panel. Um, Rory and Peter, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Um, me again. Um, look, the thing in, that troubles me about all this, the Darling River is flowing. And that's great. But a river, especially a desert river, is not just the channel. A desert river flows out onto a floodplain. And that floodplain is where most of the life is. And what we've seen, we've had some great rains and we've had some water flow down and Everyone's excited, but actually, how much flooding has there been? How much water has spilled out over the floodplain to rejuvenate the trees, the black box, the yabbies, the, um, the little water holes to create habitat for birds? I mean, actually, no, there's been almost none of that. It's been taken. So this last rain event has given us a flow, but it has not given us what a river truly is, which is a dyna dynamic system with the water flowing out over the banks and spreading. When I mean, that's been turned on its head, turned into a thing that is there for the landowner, common law rights. Oh, it's on my land, it's my water. So, you know, the very thing that gives life to the system has been twisted around and used as an argument to destroy the river. Now, my point really here is we're understanding a river as a water in a channel, but a river is not just that. It is that, but it is so much more. A river has to be a dynamic flooding system. On a, in a stochastic system, it's, you know, it's a river, a healthy river floods, it dries, it does all of those things. Thank you, Peter. Um, and Ross, do you have any final thoughts? And would you just on mute? I make uh, actually more sense when I'm muted. The, um, the, the uh, 
all I can say to people is don't be distracted. The reality is issues like indigenous rights and water rights and water management and the environment are hard for governments. And they're really happy that something like COVID distracts people. Uh, and you can deal with COVID and you can invest really heavily in, in, in virus research and, and that'll be great. Um, and it's a huge issue. But the reality is the underlying challenges that are facing Australia are in those spaces of Indigenous reconciliation, water management. We have to engage with them and don't be distracted by other issues from the importance of those underlying things like climate change, Indigenous issues, and Indigenous reconciliation and water management. Great, thank you. And Brad, did you have any final words? Yeah, thanks. Um, look, I totally agree with Ross. I might try my video, see how we go. Uh, the um, am I lagging? No, you're good. Oh, good. Go okay. Um, yeah, look, I think it's the challenge is that Aboriginal people aren't going anywhere. The rivers are going to dry out again, and they're going to be abused till they're sand. But the problem is the mob aren't going anywhere. You know, like we had the Millennium Drought, Aboriginal people population went up in the basin. Now, there was people going back to country because country was sick. And I think that's the thing is that we aren't going anywhere. You know, there was a lot of, lot of landholders that sold up their water entitlements in the millennium drought. And I think we, yeah, and then as Ross said, you know, the, the challenge of climate change, we've had two massive droughts in a row. That's not normal. And I think that that's the thing that the challenge for us is to make sure that we have a voice in this whole process because... Our mobs aren't leaving country. That's their country. They've been there for 60,000, 80,000 since the dreaming. You know, they're not going anywhere. And I suppose that's, that's, that's why we need to be involved. Because it's going to be us that, you know, like when everything's dead, the river's dead, everyone's going to set up their land and their water entitlements, but the mob is still going to be there on country. And I think that's, that's the challenge for us is that we've got to make sure that we keep banging the table and... Um, turning up to these events, you know, and I know Brother Bruce does a lot um, of banging tables and speaking passionately about his river and his country. And I think we've got to keep doing that. And the more voices we have as well, uh, the better it's going to be. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, and I might just say a special thanks to everyone that's been on the panel today. Uh, going around the circle, we have Ross Thompson, Bruce Shillingsworth, Peter Yates, Rory McLeod, Kate McBride, and Brad Mogridge. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I'm sure everyone at home is clapping into their screens. Um, and yeah, it's been really great to have this panel. Sorry again for the technical difficulties for everybody watching at home. Um, if you do want to stay up to date with all of these issues, you can follow the Tolano Station Facebook page. You can also follow the River Country Facebook page, which uh, has brought you this panel tonight. And we are launching um, the Pledge to Save the Barker, which we have run alongside the When the River Runs Dry film screenings. And we will put the pledge in the in the comments on Facebook. So do take the pledge. It involves sharing the sharing the film when the river runs dry, making sure everyone you know watches it and having a conversation at the kitchen table or over your next Zoom coffee date with all your friends and family, uh, sending letters to Parliament and organising creative online actions to make sure that the politicians know that we haven't forgot about forgotten about this issue through the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so once again, I would like to thank everyone for joining us uh, and we hope you enjoyed this at home. We'll see you next time. Thank you.